Welcome to my channel. I'm Steve Dan and this is my guitar. We're in the third part of our series looking at Hot and Top by John Schofield. I know I'm using a Telecaster this week. Um, I know that's kind of sacrilege looking at um, Schofield with a Telecaster. Um, but um, when I was changing the strings on my 335 this week, um, the stud um, screw, this thing here, um, I'm not sure whether you can see it or not, but the, the stud screw, which um, is used for securing the tailpiece, um, on the 335. The actual top part of the screw um, just came clean off and I have no idea why. It was just as I was changing the strings um, and fell inside the guitar which is really useful. So I've just ordered some new studs from Glued to Music and um, I'll put them in this afternoon if it arrives. Um, I was hoping it would arrive in time to do the lesson this morning but um, it, it hasn't. But anyway, this shows you that you can play Schofield on a Telecaster. Um, so if you've got something with um, single coils, then you can play it on a Telecaster. And he actually has started using a Telecaster more recently. So, um, so yeah, I don't think it's that bad. But, um, you know, if you um, hate me for it, stick it in the comments below. So we're looking at the solo this week. We're looking at the second 16 bars. Um, if you were watching last week, I said that I'm splitting the A section, which is all on one chord, the B flat seven sharp nine. I'm splitting that all up into three sections, so three videos. The first part, which we did last week, is 16 bars. This week is also 16 bars, and then next week will be eight bars. Then the week after, we'll take a look at the B section. Um, thanks so much if you are supporting this channel by liking and subscribing um, and commenting. Um, I always really love to hear from people. So if there's stuff that you really like, then you know, pop that below. And equally, if you've got some you know, constructive criticism, that's also useful, so stick that below as well. Um, Big thanks to my patrons. Um, you really help me in keeping doing what I'm doing here. And uh, thanks to M Holt, who joined the um, second tier in um, uh, on Patreon this week. That's the tier where you get to request a transcription of a tune of your choice. Um, and I'll do a little video as well, um, explaining some of the, the tricky bits in the tune and just generally how to play it. Um, so um, if that's of interest to you, then that's the tier to join. Um, but yeah, thanks to M Holt, who's um, who's joined that tier this week. So let's get on with it. Let's look at the uh, the first four bars of this um, this section. <laughs> So in these first four bars of um, this 16 bar section we're looking at today, it's bar 49 through to bar 52 on the transcription if you've got that in front of you. Um, Schofield opens it by um, using the familiar notes we talked about last week, G, D flat and C. And he's using that by opening with this. And he's got a slight kind of artificial harmonic there, a pinched harmonic. We talked about pinched harmonics last week where you kind of retract in your pick a little bit and you're hitting the string with the pick and also with a little bit of the flash of the thumb as well and you can hear the harmonic series as i move more towards the neck from the bridge um, and he's somewhere around the middle so that that harmonic that he's bringing out is different you know depending on where you're playing it um and i, I think from what i can hear when i slow it down he's playing somewhere around the middle so he's got that the, those notes there, which we talked about last week, is the kind of ambiguity between minor and major, and he's trying to create that tension with his with his lines. In the second bar, in bar fifty, he's got that a firmly minor pentatonic kind of sound. So that's that's really you know undebatable. That's minor there he's using, but in that first bar, it's kind of you know is it minor or is it major? Um, you could say it's Dorian, but you know it's not. There's not enough information there for us to make a decision about it. I think that he's just kind of using the ambiguity between minor and major, and that's why he selected those notes. So that's you know, if you want to create that tension in your solo, then do the same. Um, the next bar in this little phrase is super cool. I really like this. 
I, I just think it's such a great line and it mixes that blues and bebop language together. And the bebop language comes from the enclosure that he's using at the top. So for any of you that have been you know, on my channel for a little while, you will remember the Midnight Blue series we did um, over August. And we talked about enclosure there because Kenny Burrell uses enclosure. So enclosure is basically where you've got a note that you want to aim for. Um, so in this case, you know, D, and then you go chromatically above, so a semitone above, and then chromatically below, so a semitone below, and then the note itself. So E flat, D flat, and D. And the cool thing that Schofield's doing here is he's, a, he's approaching it from below, from the D flat, to the D itself, and then above, and then below, and then the note itself again. So you get this really cool, which is super chromatic and really beboppy, um, and also nice and bluesy at the same time with that bend at the end. And it adds to the kind of boppy nature because he's kind of swinging it. Um, so yeah, really work on that, get that into your playing. I remember encountering a really cool use of enclosure when I went to see Martin Taylor and Tommy Emmanuel play on the Colonel and the Governor tour um, here in Exeter. And they played at, um, I think it was St. George's Hall at the time, um, but it's now the Corn Exchange. Um, and Martin Taylor did this really super cool, super fast run up of a major triad by using chromatic enclosure. Um, I don't remember what the 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 um, the key was, but um, we'll just use B flat here um, because we're in B flat. And what it was was this, and it was just really super cool to hear that in a solo. Um, so I've slowed it down so that you can take a look and learn it for yourself. So here it is. So as you can see, what he's done is he's taken the B flat triad, B flat, D, F, and B flat, and he's going chromatically above the B flat, so to B, then below to A, and then to B flat itself, and then the same for the D, above D, E flat, down to D flat, and then D, and then the same for the F, above the F, so G flat, then below for E, and then the F itself, and then he just repeats the, the first one again an octave up. B, A, B flat, so. So really, really cool to get into your solo. And there's another way that you can do this, you can kind of vary it by going diatonically above, so using a note from the scale, so B flat major, and then go chromatically below, so a semitone below. Um, so here's that. Here it is broken down, you've got C above, A, which is actually also in the scale as well, and then B flat, and then E flat, diatonic to B flat, and then below to D flat, which is chromatic, so it's not in the scale, but semitone below, and then to D, and then for the F, diatonically above for G, chromatically below for the E, and then F, and then a repeat at the top again. So. So that's another way of doing enclosure. Um, so yeah, super cool idea, get it into your solos. So let's take a look at the next four bars. So in these four bars, super aggressive, and I really like this. He's kind of got this. It's almost like there's um there's a there's a punch up or something, you know. And you know we've got you know fists being thrown um, in this particular bar in bar 53, and there's like four jabs, and I just think it's really cool. And you know he's got loads of bending, really short staccato kind of pointillistic phrases, and then ends with that mute to a bend. Um, and then in the next bar kind of continues in the same fashion, but we've got this something called an exchange bend, which is basically where as you bend up, you kind of bar roll across the strings rather than coming off of the strings altogether. Um, Hendrix uses this quite a bit and Steve Ray Vaughan. That kind of thing. That's an exchange bend. As you bend up, you kind of exchange onto the next string and Schofield's doing that. 
and he's using a mute as he drags backwards across the strings and then lands on that blue note. So here's, here's a slowed down version of an exchange bend for you to see a bit more close up. After that, there's more aggressiveness. He's kind of got this slide from nowhere to nowhere. Um, I don't think he would have known where he was going from or to at the time. I pinpointed it on the actual track as a D um, at the 12th fret. So just really cool. It's just got some real flair into it as he plays it. And I'm probably not playing it exactly accurate as he played it, but it's arguable that when he was playing it, he was probably getting really into it. I've seen him live and he get, you know, his real bodily movements as he's playing this and he's really wrestling the guitar. And there's not so much of a focus on the quality of the note, but more just the vibe and the sound. Um, and here he's really trying to get that kind of aggressive nature across. So don't forget that in your solos. So another thing to take away from this, um, aside from the aggressiveness and the exchange bend, is that also I think he's using something called a hexatonic scale here. And a hexatonic scale is basically a six note scale. You can achieve it by either taking a note away from a seven note scale, like a major scale, or by adding on to a pentatonic scale. And a blues scale is a hexatonic scale. Um, you've got six notes in that. One, two, three, four, five, six unique notes, and then the octave at the top there. Um, now you can make your own hexatonic scales. Um, after reading The Improviser's OS by Wayne Krantz, I was really inspired to do that. Um, and I think it's something that, you know, the, the more that you practice these particular ideas and repeat them, they're going to get into your playing. And I think this is what Schofield's done here. I don't for one minute think that he would have been thinking halfway through the solo, oh, I'll use a hexatonic scale. I think it's more that this particular idea he practiced at some point in his um, journey and uh, and it's just seeped into his playing. And so I think what he's using is, is this hexatonic scale, which it's not strictly a Dorian hexatonic um, because that's something different, but I think it's a form of a Dorian hexatonic. I couldn't actually find a name for it despite doing quite a lot of research on it. Um, so if you know what it is, then let me know. But here it is. <laughs> As you can see, we've got a, a minor pentatonic scale, but all we've done is just added a major six into it, which I see as borrowed from the the, um, the Dorian. So it's giving that Dorian flavor, and that's why I think hexatonic scales can be used for is giving that flavor. And I think they are just, you know, they're really cool for evoking a certain sound. So I think that's kind of what Schofield's doing here. Um, I'm not 100% certain, but it just certainly sounds like it. But do go and check out Wayne Krantz's Improvisers OS because he talks more about this type of approach to scales. You know, he calls them formulas, um, and it just you know gives you a certain it gives you a certain sound. Um, and I just think it's a really cool approach. So as he gets to the end of that really aggressive thing, um, he ends on the flat third and bends it. Really cool, really cool idea. Bends it through the major third and then lands on the fourth and then runs up the scale. Now this is something to talk about here in that, you know, in having lessons, I remember being told that running up and down scales in a solo wasn't a good idea and I should avoid it because it's not good phrasing and it's not good melody making. And um, Schofield's using it more than once in this solo. So, um, and he's an absolute master. So I, I don't think that that's really a good thing to, to teach, a, a good way of teaching. I think it's not necessarily a good idea to run them like that, you know, that's slightly boring, but what you can do is you can use your scale to run up um, because it creates um, intensity and, you know, you, you're going somewhere in your solo. Um, and I, th I think, you know, what Schofield's doing here is amazing because he's varying the rhythm and he's using legato to make it interesting. So landing on that ninth at the top there. So I think that's something, you know, try that in your solos. Try taking a, a scale, like a pentatonic scale, like Schofield's using here. Try varying the rhythm a little bit or adding legato. And he's switching between two positions. So going, sliding into the second position and then back into the first position again. And I think that, you know, that's another way of varying it as well. So you can take these really kind of dry, um, ideas and make them interesting by varying the rhythm and varying how you actually execute it. So he lands this this run up of the scale on the ninth. So 
on the on the C. And this is where he brings in a D flat major seven arpeggio. D flat major seven, D flat is the relative major. So um, each major has a relative minor, each minor has a relative major. And D flat is the relative major of B flat. Um, if you don't know what a relative major is, um, I'm not really gonna go into it too much here, but the the each major um, chord has a relative minor, and the relative minor is based on this the sixth degree of that particular scale. So D flat, your relative minor is gonna be B flat. And so we would call the, the, the relative major, if we're kind of in B flat land, uh, B flat minor land, we would call the relative major D flat. Um, and the reason why they're called relative is because they, they share the same notes. Um, so the B flat minor scale shares the same notes as D flat major. And what he's using here is a D flat major seven arpeggio, which is this. <laughs> and he's using the top end of it, so. Now this gives a B flat minor nine kind of sound when you've got a B flat in the bass, like we have. So D flat, C, A flat, F, and then B flat in the bass. So that gives you a B flat minor nine sound, which is cool, quite fruity sounding, and gives a certain level of sophistication. If you're running out of ideas in your solo and you're playing in B flat, try playing in D flat, but also use this in different keys. If you're in A minor, try C. If you're in E minor, try G. And then he ends this particular passage with a nice kind of bluesy bend, which um, is something he's using quite a lot in this solo, a bend up to the ninth. So he's using like, you know, blues kind of phrasing, but using, you know, notes that aren't pentatonic. So he's using a ninth. So really cool, try that. Let's move on to the next four bars. So there's a bit of a break for the first two beats of the next bar. Um, he starts on the, the second semiquaver with his next phrase. Um, that's something to think about as well, to add that kind of funk into your playing. Um, don't always start on the beat. Start on the um, on the second quaver or on the second semiquaver or on the third semiquaver or on the fourth semiquaver. You know, try starting on the offbeat, on the back foot, you know, because it, it just adds that level of funk. Um, here I would say start with an up pick because we're starting on the offbeat. Just, I think starting on the, the down, I was experimenting this when I was practicing it, starting on, the, on a down pick, just that, just it disrupts the flow of it a little bit and it just doesn't really sound right to my ears. So I would suggest starting with an up. And he's got that really playful thing with the trills. Don't try and make it too accurate. It's you know very indicative this kind of playful thing that he's doing of of the character of the tune um, that it's quite rough and ready. Um, it's not massively accurate. It's more about the vibe, and he's not playing it to the grid. It's not like he's playing kind of slowing down, speeding up a little bit, and so it's more again more about the vibe. You won't be able to get it exactly the same as he does, but you know just the general approach. Um, and then the next thing that we've got on here is this cool approach to octaves. And he kind of blends the two together slightly, like that. So you, you get this semitonal thing kind of going on here, um, this tension, and Schofield does that quite a lot where he takes a major seventh or a minor second um, interval and you know creates this really tense sound and then resolves it. So he's resolving it into an octave. I think you know a good exercise, because this is a cool thing to do in your solos, a good exercise is to run through the minor pentatonic scale using this approach where you've got the, the, the actual note at the top, the B flat, and then you go to a semitone below the octave, and then slide into the octave itself, and then and then run laterally up the neck um, with the minor pentatonic scale. So something like this. And then he finishes off these this four bar phrase with um, some more minor pentatonic vo vocabulary. Again, starting you know on that second semiquaver there, one, 
and then this leads nicely connects into the next four bars which is this <laughs> So at the beginning of this next phrase, um, we've got um, more of this kind of Dorian-y or Dorian hexatonic um, or you know, ambiguity between minor and major. Um, so... And you can kind of hear that it's it's kind of, you know, got that major-y kind of sound at the beginning and then resolves to minor at the end. And I think that is, again, his, you know, he's exploiting that, that ambiguity between minor and major. Um, so just remember to do that in your solos. And you know, another thing to note as well is that you know, that particular group of notes at the beginning, he varies in the next bar to get more mileage out of it. So, and then in the next bar it's, so there's a bit more of a longer, uh, there's, there's more of a longer duration on that third note. Um, and that's something cool. You'll get more mileage out of your solos if you kind of repeat something that you've just done and then vary it. He did that back earlier in the, the last 16 bars, so take a look at the other video for that. So in the second half of this phrase, he's using something um, which is called timing displacement. And so it's not something that's, you know, harmonically interesting. It's rhythmically interesting here. And, you know, this is something that you can definitely use in your playing. So timing displacement is basically where you take a group of notes that kind of conflicts with the underlying meter. So the underlying meter that we've got here is kind of duple because everything divides into two. And then his group is in threes. So you've got this kind of three against two um, kind of thing going on. And, you know, this is a really, really good thing to use in your solos because you're not resolving harmonically, you're resolving rhythmically. So, okay. Um, and he's got those three groups of D flat, E flat and F. Um, here's a, a little exercise for practicing timing displacement using the B flat minor pentatonic scale. So as you can see, we kind of resolve on the last note of the group of three with the with the B flat. So. So that's where we're resolving there. You could keep going until you could keep going until you resolve with the first note of the group on B flat on beat one. It takes quite a few bars to do that. Um, but it's just something to get into your solos, this timing displacement, um, because it makes people feel uneasy until it's resolved. And it's a good use of tension that isn't harmonic. So you, you don't have to have loads of chromatic or jazz vocabulary to be able to create tension in your solos. You can use it with something as simple as a minor pentatonic scale and some rhythmic displacement. So try it with groups of threes. And then if you want to be really brave, try it with groups of fives and sevens. Um, it's really cool when you use odd groupings. So, what are our takeaways from this solo? I think the first thing for taking away from this solo is the use of enclosure. Um, I think, you know, we talked about this in, like I said, in the Midnight Blue series. Um, enclosure is really cool if you want to get that kind of boppy language um, into your solos. Try, so try using enclosure in your solos. The second thing is, you know, trying hexatonic scales. Um, we've already got one in our vocabulary, which is the blue scale, easy peasy one. You can also make another one by replacing that blue note with that Dorian note like we've done here. And like I think um, Schofield did, um, or at least did at one point, and it's just seeped into his playing. Number three, um, is using the relative major to create a bit more of um, a sophisticated kind of sound um, over the top of your solos. So in this case, we're using D flat because um, you can get your relative major by going up three semitones. Um, so use that in your solos, whatever minor key you're in, go three frets up and play the major and you've got your relative major. Um, and then the final thing is, um, I think is really important is timing displacement like we just looked at. So taking you know groups of three or groups of five, groups of seven, and superimposing that over the top of your duple meter, which is you know in two or four. Um, so those are your things to be practicing this week. Um, as I said, if you want to support me, then um, www.patreon.com forward slash extra guitar lessons is the place to go for that. And there you will find the backing track, the full transcription of the solo up to now, and also the scale and exercise pack. Um, so head over there if you want to support me. 
And don't forget to like and subscribe because I think it helps people to be able to see um, the video in the, um, in the search rankings. Um, so have a good practice. I'll see you next week for the last part of the A section.